Good morning. morning. Welcome to our worship for today. We're going to once again resume our study of Romans chapter 8. And in our study where we stopped last time, the Apostle Paul has introduced to us a new subject, a subject that is going to carry through to the end of the chapter. And the subject is suffering. And today, um, in the verse before us, uh, verse 18, The Apostle Paul is doing a comparison. And a comparison is the sufferings of this life versus the glory that we were going to have with Christ in eternity. And Paul tells us this morning there is no comparison. That the glories that we are going to experience with Christ far outweigh any type of suffering that we might endure in this life. So uh, today our focus is on this truth that we need to keep this truth ever before our eyes as we go through this world because that is our encouragement. With those thoughts in mind, we bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we have gathered for worship, we thank you for this opportunity to be fed by your love as we experience it in the gospel both in word and in sacrament. We pray for a rich measure of your Holy Spirit that he might lead us in all truth and that this truth might be firmly engrafted in our hearts, that we might gain wisdom and in this wisdom be led in a way that brings us comfort and joy throughout our entire lives. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Today we begin our worship with our opening hymn, Lord Jesus Christ, be present now. Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, 
Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Our scripture readings for today are the readings for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. And for our first lesson, we turn to the book of the prophet Ezekiel. We read verses 1 through 4 and then verses 25 through 32. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean, you who keep repeating the proverb concerning the soil of Israel? Fathers eat sour grapes and their sons' teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will never again use this proverb in Israel. Indeed, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father is mine, just like the soul of the Son. The soul who sins is the one who will die. But you say, the Lord's way is not fair. Listen now, house of Israel. Is it my way that is not fair? Is it not your ways that are not fair? If a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and practices unrighteousness, he will die because of it. Because of the unrighteousness that he has practiced, he will die. But if a wicked man turns from his wickedness that he has done and practices justice and righteousness, he will preserve his life. Because he has seen and turned away from all the rebellious acts that he had committed. He will surely live, and he will not die. But the house of Israel says, the Lord's way is not fair. Is it really my ways that are not fair, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are not fair? Therefore, I will judge each one of you according to his ways, O house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your rebellious acts so that you will not set out a stumbling block that makes you guilty. Throw off from yourselves all your rebellious actions by which you have rebelled and obtain a new heart and a new spirit for yourselves. Why should you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. So repent and live. Here ends our first scripture lesson. Today's psalm is Psalm 25. This morning we will join in reading the psalm responsibly. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love. For they are from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. Turn to me and be gracious to me. For I am lonely and afflicted. Look upon my affliction and my distress. And take away all my sins. Guard my life and rescue me. For I take refuge in you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. For our second lesson, we continue now in a series of readings from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And the second, our reading today comes from the second chapter as we begin reading at verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion... Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit, and having one mind. 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility consider one another better than yourselves. Let each of you look carefully not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness, and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here ends our reading from Philippians. Alleluia. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Alleluia. Please rise for a reading from the Gospels. Today's Gospel reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. We begin reading at verse 28. Jesus said, What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. He came to the second and said the same thing. The second son answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Amen, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of the righteousness But you did not believe him. However, the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. Even when you saw this, you did not change your mind and believe him. Here ends our reading from the Gospels. Praise be to you, O Christ. We now join in making confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and a life for the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn for this morning is Lord Jesus Christ, the Church's Head.
I invite you to join with me today in giving your devout attention to the 18th verse of the 8th chapter of Romans, where Paul would write, For I conclude that our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue in our study of this most wonderful chapter of Scripture, we pray for your spirit today. May by the power of your spirit we keep our eyes fixed on the future glory that you have prepared for us, so that as we go through this life we do not become discouraged, but in all things find our hope in your grace. Be with us with your spirit today as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Often in life, in order for us to persevere through a very difficult time, we've got to have an objective. We've got to have a goal that we are reaching for. I remember that when I was 19 years old, the month of August, just a few short weeks before I was to return back to college to begin my sophomore year, the Lord in his wisdom took home the soul of one of my grandfathers. And after the funeral, as, was, as is customary, we got together as family and friends in the church basement. And in the course of that fellowship, a lady approached me. I can't remember exactly who it was. But she asked me the question, knowing that I was preparing for the ministry, how many more years do you have to go? Thought for a second, said rather, discouragingly, seven more. It seemed like a lifetime when I was 19 years old, but it was the goal to enter into the ministry that helped me in the course of all those years of training, which really started as a freshman in high school, that enabled me to keep on and continue in that training. For most people, Setting goals in life is extremely important. We set educational goals, we set career goals, we set financial goals, we set retirement goals, we set recreational goals. All these things are very familiar to us and there's nothing wrong with having goals in our lives, things that we want to achieve. But what makes these goals very unhealthy for us is if we don't include something in the process of setting those goals. James speaks of this. He says to us, when you make these plans and you make these goals, you always have to do it in a way that Jesus has taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done. These goals are fine as long as we are making them under the concept, if it is the Lord's will will. Because we know that as we go through this life, there are going to be obstacles, there's going to be hindrances, sufferings, and disappointment as we try to reach those goals. And sometimes we don't realize those goals because of these struggles that we face in this life. Because you see, our worldly goals are not guaranteed. All these goals that we set for ourselves need to be set under the most supreme goal. And that supreme goal is a goal for which we do not pray, your will be done. It is a goal that is guaranteed to us, guaranteed to us in the blood of Jesus Christ, guaranteed to us in his perfect life, his innocent suffering and death, and the assurance of his resurrection and ascension into heaven. It is a guaranteed goal of a life of perfection, a life of glory. It comes to us simply by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The certainty of this goal, that someday we will be freed from all the sufferings of this life and allowed to enter into God's glory, enables us to deal with the sufferings of this life and the disappointments that we are guaranteed to expect as we try to attain our earthly goals. When this treasure, this treasure of being Christ for an eternity is our main goal in life, 
is the focus of our life, then we can deal with the disappointments that are going to come our way and the sufferings that we are going to experience. And then when we take a look at the sufferings of this life, they are very small in comparison to what Christ has prepared for us. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of our service today, Paul has taken up this subject of suffering actually in the previous verse. We talked about it in our previous study, and he's going to continue to talk about this now until the end of the chapter. He is going to deal with it. He's going to wrestle with it. He's going to wrestle with us as we wrestle with this subject. It's a subject that all of us have to deal with. It's a subject that all of us have to wrestle with, and it is a subject that finds its answer only in God's grace. So as Paul works out the very real parts of our life, this part of suffering, today we want to be encouraged by Paul's words with this thought in mind. Let your treasure be your future glory. Consider this question for a moment. Is Christianity just some mindless thing in which we as God's people are to disengage our brains? The answer to that is most definitely not. We need to resist the temptation of our culture today because our culture has disengaged their brains. I think one of the biggest reasons for that is our lives are so controlled by technology. Deductive thinking is becoming less and less a part of the human experience. We need to resist that temptation and we need to use this God-given ability of deductive thinking, not in and of it by itself, but we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us through God's word to use this deductive thinking in a way that is going to lead us to better understand this subject of suffering. Certainly God has created us as creatures with feelings and there's nothing wrong with these feelings, but what is wrong is if we allow simply our feelings to control our lives, again, as so much of our culture does today, and not use this brain that God has given to us to process these things based upon the truth of God's word. And so Paul writes in the words of our text after he has introduced this subject of suffering, he said, for I conclude that our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Paul uses the word conclude. He says, as you go through sufferings, don't shut your brain off and just mindlessly go through this. No, he says, you need to think about it. And when we think about it and think of all of God's truth, we can come to a conclusion. Paul is saying to us that after much prayerful thought, he has concluded a truth about this suffering. The verb that is translated conclude here has the idea of looking at something very carefully, examining it very closely. And then after spending time examining it, looking at it, contemplating it, you're going to draw a conclusion. What follows in this chapter is really two large sections in which Paul is going to introduce those sections with not I feel, but with the word I know. Definite truths that we can come to about our suffering in this life. But before he gets to it, he has this general conclusion that he puts before us this morning. And when you consider the conclusion that he is saying to us, he's showing us, notice again in that verse, where I conclude that our sufferings, he's saying we are going to have sufferings. And that again is something that we need to keep straight in our minds. We will suffer in this life. Jesus confirmed that in the upper room with his disciples. Before he leaves them, he says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace in me. In this world, you are going to have trouble but be courageous, I have overcome the world. And the rest of the New Testament makes it very clear that as God's people, we are going to experience suffering. Paul, in writing the Philippian congregation, said, For it has been graciously granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, 
but also to suffer for him. And then Peter wrote to a group of Christians who are suffering for the gospel, instead rejoice whenever you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now these sufferings can come into our life for a couple of reasons. Now these sufferings, first of all, can be experienced by us because we are people who are led by God's spirit, who have become like Christ Jesus, and we're living in a world that is following their father, who is Satan, who is the father of lies. And they hate us. And when we live out our Christianity, they're gonna demonstrate that hatred toward us. That's just a fact of life. That's what Jesus was saying. That's what Paul was alluding to. That's what Peter was addressing. But then there are those sufferings that we experience in life that are simply the result of being sinners living in a sinful existence. And those sufferings can be physical. Those sufferings can be mental. Those sufferings can be emotional. God makes it very clear to us that as long as we're in this life, in this present existence, this present time, we are going to have suffering. Now, we have to resist the thinking of the unbelieving world here again. Because what has the unbelieving world told us? They have said that they can figure out, they can find a way to make this existent suffering free. And I mean, that's never more prominent than when you get into an election year, right? I mean, politicians are constantly trying to say to the constituency, I've got all the answers to your problems, and if you elect me, I'm going to fix everything. And I'm going to give you a life that is guaranteed from the cradle to the grave, and you're never going to have to suffer. The only thing they say they haven't had enough time of is time. Give us enough time, and we'll figure it out. That's a pipe dream. That's a dream that has been put before the people of this world by Satan. Scripture makes it very clear that we are going to suffer. And when we do suffer, again, it's important for us to keep straight. We're not being punished by God. It's no accident that the Holy Spirit has started this chapter where he begins to deal with the subject of suffering with these most glorious words. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Always keep those words before you. Because Paul said in the verses just after that, God dealt with that sin. He dealt with that son in, sin in his son, Jesus Christ. So you're not condemned. God's not punishing you. That's the first thought that Satan wants to bring into our minds when we're dealing with suffering and hardship in this life. So what is the conclusion now that Paul draws after he establishes the truth that we are going to have suffering? Well, he says no matter how bad the suffering is, he said it's small in comparison to what awaits us in the glories of heaven. The picture here is of a scale as you have there in the graphic. Now notice, this is a scale that is unbalanced, isn't it? The red ball is obviously much heavier because it's down and the white ball is up in the air. The white ball here depicts our sufferings. The red ball depicts the glories of heaven. He is saying to us that no matter how bad it is in this life, what we have waiting for us far outweighs anything that we might endure in this present age, in the world right now, in its present form. Paul says what awaits us is glorious. The word that he uses here in the original in the Greek is a word that depicts something that is absolutely extraordinary. Have you come to the realization that our future glories cannot even be understood to any real degree by us on this side of eternity. By that I mean they're so great, they're so wonderful, there's no, nothing in this life in which we experience pleasure that begins to measure up to what God has prepared for us in heaven. When you take a look at scripture, the interesting thing about heaven is there's only a few descriptions of of our future glory. And the reason for that is because we can't comprehend it. Considering some of the descriptions, and a number of them are actually found in the book of Revelation, there's a number of them in Revelation chapter 19 to the end, 
There is another one in Revelation chapter 7, which we won't consider this morning. But I want to consider, first of all, the one that is found in chapter 19. This is a picture of the feast, this wedding feast that we are going to participate in. Now think about this again. The description that scripture gives to us is Jesus is the bridegroom and we're his bride, right? And when you go to any wedding, generally speaking, there's a meal, there's a feast, there's a festival, so to speak. Well, this is a feast that's going to go on for eternity. Here's how John describes it. He says, And I heard what seemed to be the roar of a large crowd and the roar of many waters or the sound of loud rumblings of thunder saying, Alleluia! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory because the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready and she was given bright, clean, fine linen to wear. What a wonderful picture. We are now going to be united with our bridegroom face to face. You know, the anticipation. You think about a wedding again, the anticipation. You know, the, the rule is the bride is not to see the groom before the wedding begins, you know. Well, we haven't seen our, our groom face to face. We've seen him in the scriptures. We've seen him in the gospel. We haven't seen him face to face. We're going to see him face to face. Notice the beautiful clothing that we are being given. We are going to be radiant. We are going to be his glory, you see. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, we have this wonderful description. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So there again is that bridegroom relationship pictured. And from the throne I heard a loud voice that said, Look, God is dwelling with his people. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. You, know, you think about that, God being with us, ruling us. This is not a tyrant. This is someone who loves us, someone who cares for us, someone who has only our best interest at heart. God himself will be with them and be their God. And what is he going to do as our gracious, loving father for eternity? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain because the former things has passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And he also said, Write, for these words are trustworthy and true. This glory is beyond our comprehension. And this glory is going to be revealed to us when either we're called out of this life through death and in a more majestic way when Jesus comes again in all of his glory on the last day. Every January, February, you know, you have the auto show over in Detroit, and this is the big opportunity for the automakers to introduce what's new in their lineup. And a lot of times that new vehicle is displayed there on stage, and it's covered. Everybody's wondering what's underneath that covering, right? And then they, they build you up, and they build you up, and at the right moment, they reveal it. They pull the covering off. That's the picture here. Jesus is going to, on the last day, pull that covering off. What is that going to involve? That's going to involve, first of all, him coming in all of his glory with his angels. And all those who have died prior to this are going to rise from their graves. And he is going to assemble before himself all the peoples of the world. Paul depicts it this way in Athens as he speaks to the people. He says, God has set a day on which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. That is Jesus. And he will provide proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Jesus is going to judge the living and the dead. And he is going to sort out the people. Two, two groups. Those who believed and those who did not. Those who trusted in the righteousness of Christ for their salvation and those who did not. And he's going to send those who rejected him away from him. Just as the glory that it will be revealed in us is beyond our comprehension, the torment of hell is beyond our comprehension as well. And then what is he going to do? He's going to do something that is again beyond our understanding. Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements will be dissolved as they burn with great heat and the earth and what is done on it will be burned up. Gone. Scorched. Not obliterated, but scorched. 
This world that we thought was so grand and glorious, this world and all the things in it that we thought were so valuable, scorched, gone. Is he done? No, he's not done. Because he's going to make something new. And in the 21st chapter of Revelation there, we were, we were told about that. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. You know the word that he used at the beginning of creation? When he first created things, he said, let there be, and there was, right? Well, he's going to say, let there be. And he's going to restore this world to the, to the former way it was when he first created it. He is going to restore it to perfection. And it is in this new heaven and this new earth that his people will now live for all eternity. So how then do we keep our present sufferings from weighing us down and discourage, discouraging us in this life? We keep this in front of us. We keep this as the focal point of our lives. When you take a look at the scriptures, this is what God's people did from beginning to end. For instance, let's go to the book of Hebrews. Right to the Hebrews here in the 11th chapters, talking about all the heroes of faith. And in these verses, he's talking about Moses, Look at what he says. He says, by faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter when he grew up. He chose to be mistreated with God's people rather than enjoy sin for a little while. He considered disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. What is he saying? He could have lived in the, in the court of Pharaoh for the rest of his life and ignored his people, but he didn't. He could have lived in the lap of luxury, but he didn't. He went and joined his people because he saw as the greater treasure what God was going to prepare for him in Christ. And when we turn to the New Testament, I mean, I could have cited here this morning passage after passage after passage that talks about how God's people are looking forward to this new glory. One example is found in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, as a result, you do not lack any gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also keep you strong unto the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul says, You're not, you don't lack anything now. You won't lack anything in the course of your life. God is going to give you everything. Notice that last part, he says, who's called you into fellowship with his son. What does that mean? Well, if you think about our epistle reading for today, what is Paul saying there? What did he say? He said, Jesus did not consider his deity something to be put on display, but instead, he, what, did he, what was he willing to do? He humbled himself. Humbled himself for what purpose? To suffer. He had no sin, but he came into this world to, for the purpose to suffer. He was like us in any way, and he had the ultimate suffering by allowing himself to be nailed to the cross to suffer for the sins of the entire world. He shared in our suffering. He is not oblivious to our suffering. He understands our suffering. That's something that the writer to the Hebrews tells us as well. But when you read, when you listened to that reading this morning, it didn't stop with the suffering, did it? Because he suffered, he completed what the Father sent him to do. And then what did he do? The Father glorified him. He raised him from the dead, put him back into glory, and he didn't just stay here in glory. He went back to his throne on high to rule everything in the best interest of his church. This is you and me. Sharing in his suffering, we are also guaranteed we will share in his glory. And that's what we must keep in mind. We must not allow Satan to deceive us and lead us into putting all of our eggs in this basket because those eggs are all going to get smashed. Our eggs are in the basket of eternity. When we have this future glory as our most prized possession, what then is our daily prayer? Well, it is the prayer that is found at the end of the Bible. In the 22nd chapter of Revelation, we're told the one who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming. Who's that? Jesus. He says, I'm coming. I'm coming. How is our response? Could you give me a few days? Could you wait a while? I got things I want to do here. Now, God's people respond very quickly. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. 
Come, Lord Jesus. Is that your daily prayer? Do you spend your days going to the gospel to be reminded of the rich inheritance that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you spend your days going to that gospel, reminding yourself of what God has done for you in Christ Jesus so that your relationship was strengthened and your salvation is made even more secure? Is it your day-to-day purpose to bring this message of salvation to other people, to use everything that God has given to you for that purpose and to go to your fellow Christians and offer encouragement as they experience suffering so that they can return to you and experience and you can experience that same strengthening through the gospel as well. You know what happens when we do all these things? We become people who are content. We become people who are secure. And we become people who can weather the storms of the sufferings of this life. For we know that what we see in this godless world should be no surprise to us. It's what God has predicted. It's what God has told us will happen. But we also know that we have the confidence of the Apostle Paul who wrote, I thank my God every time I remember you. Every time I pray for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I am convinced of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that comforting? We know that no matter what we experience in this life, God is going to carry us through until we get to the end. May God the Holy Spirit enable all of us to persevere faithfully until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes again in all of his glory. And may he use us Use us to show the world what the most prized possession is that we can have. And that possession is the salvation that is found only in Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, after the fall into sin, you approached Adam and Eve to convict them of their sin and also reveal to them the consequences of their actions. And the consequences of their actions was that life was going to be difficult, life was going to be hard, and life was going to be filled with many challenges and suffering. But in your grace, in that same context, before you revealed these things to them, you shared with them a message of hope, the only hope. And that hope was that one day you were going to send Jesus. And how privileged we are to stand here today, having been able to see all of these promises unfolded in the life of your son. We have seen his perfect life. We have stood at the foot of the cross and seen his horrific suffering on our behalf. And we have stood at the open tomb, seeing the wonderful glory that is now his as your son who has completed this plan on our behalf. And in your love for us, you have sent your spirit into our lives that through the message of your love found in your son, we have seen our sin, but we have placed our hope and our trust in our savior, Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean as we go through this life now, our lives are going to be free from the struggles of living in a sinful world. So Heavenly Father, as we go through this life and experience the sufferings of this life, so many of them unexpected, so many of them coming upon us in a torrential form that they feel overwhelming, remind us 
of the future glory that you have prepared for us. Remind us that our sufferings here in this life are only for a short period of time. Remind us that the glory that is about to be revealed to us in Christ is something that is beyond our comprehension and understanding. Help us keep that at the center of our lives. Help us to realize this is the most important thing, not only for us, but for others. Help us to each day be compassionate toward others, sharing the gospel message with others, and help us to find that deep compassion for one another. Remind us that we are not alone in this walk. You walk with us. The Spirit walks with us. But you have also given us the fellowship of the church, which we so often neglect, which we so often take for granted. May this be something that is so precious to us that we find great comfort in the fact that we love one another in the same way that you have loved us and that together as we walk this path, we will make our way through these sufferings until that day when you will take us into your glory where there will be no more suffering. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning on behalf of Dwayne Garland, who this coming Friday will undergo open heart surgery. We pray that as he approaches Friday, you will take fear out of his heart and remind him that his life rests securely in your hands. We ask you to be with the surgeon as he undergoes this surgery, that everything might go well, and that as he recovers from this procedure, he may heal completely and be able to return to your house to praise and worship his name. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated as the elders will now distribute the elements for the Lord's Supper.
now partake of the Lord's Supper. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which was given into death for all of your sins. Take drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace, rejoicing, confident that your sins are forgiven. Amen. As we reflect upon the wonderful blessings the Lord has given to us in the sacrament, the elders will collect the empty containers. Please rise. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Today's service closes with Jesus, Savior, Pilate, me. <laughs>